There is a deep, dark secret hidden at the heart of modern emulation. Look, I'm a big fan of emulation. I love being able to play all my favorite childhood hits on modern day hardware. But we need to stop pretending that it's just as good as the real thing, because it isn't. If you really want to play your favorite games as they were intended to look, feel, and sound, well then you need the original hardware. Why is that? Well, it's because when you're emulating old retro games, you're essentially using a bunch of software trickery to interpret and convert old code. The work that used to be done by four or five chips and old retro game consoles is now being done by just one. And the only reason that works is because modern CPUs are so much faster than the original hardware. Thank you, Moore's Law. But doing it that way introduces problems. Things that used to happen simultaneously are now happening sequentially. And also, weird little quirks of the original hardware are just hard to replicate with software. The result is games that don't quite look, feel, and sound right. So what's the solution to the problem then? Is it just to have a closet filled with tons of old retro game consoles and a dresser filled with hundreds of cartridges? I mean, as much as I would actually like that, I think there is a much better solution for most people. I'm talking about emulation, but not the type of emulation that I just finished telling you sucks. No, I'm talking about hardware emulation. This right here is a DE10 Nano, and it's actually a really interesting little tool made by Intel. At the heart of this mini computer is an FPGA, or a Field Programmable Gate Array, and that's just a fancy way of saying a chip that can reprogram itself. Most computer chips are very rigid in their operation. They're really only designed to function in a handful of predetermined ways. This allows them to be made very small, very power efficient, and very cheap. An FPGA, on the other hand, trades all of that in the name of flexibility. This guy can reconfigure itself on the fly to functionally become other hardware. So today, we are going to create a purpose-built emulation machine that should, in theory at least, be functionally identical to the real thing. It's like emulation on steroids, and I am so excited to try it out. So the very first thing we have to do is naturally unbox a 3D printer. That's right, today's video is sponsored by Anker Make and their brand new M5C 3D printer. Now this 3D printer has some seriously cool features that I can't wait to show you, but first we have to free this thing from its cardboard confines. Traditionally, setting up 3D printers has been a huge pain in the ass, but everything about this printer has been optimized to make it as user and as beginner friendly as possible. And this extends right down to the unboxing experience. Everything is laid out in a way that makes the initial assembly as easy as possible. The instructions even come printed on these giant sheets that were really easy to follow. I slotted the gantry into the base and then started screwing everything together which didn't take long because this entire machine only takes 12 screws to put together, and four of them are for this filament holder. All in, I went from fully boxed to fully set up in less than 15 minutes, and I was filming it. Before I could start printing though, I needed to pair the printer with the Anker Make app on my phone. This app lets you control every aspect of the printer, and if you wanted to, you could control the M5C exclusively from the app which is pretty cool. You can also use it to customize the functionality of this big play pause button, which lets you do everything from printing the latest files in a USB drive, to leveling the bed, to pausing the current print. It's all very slick and very easy to use. So for the last few days, I have been plugging away at a custom design case. I started by taking some very precise measurements of the DE10 and then creating a 3D model in Fusion 360. I think it's gonna look awesome, and I even got some gunmetal gray PLA to print it in. So let's see how the M5C does when it comes to actually printing. Having an easy to set up 3D printer is meaningless if its software isn't also easy to use. Luckily, the Anker Make desktop app delivers on that promise as well. With a couple of clicks, I was able to load my first component, position it on the build plate, and well, their slicer took care of everything from there. There is an advanced mode where you can customize things more, but I really wanted to test out what it would be like to use this printer as a complete newbie. Over in the preview tab, the slicer let me know exactly how much filament I would use and then how long the print would take. After that, it was just a single click and the machine started heating up and running through its pre-print calibrations. So in a minute, we'll see if this machine's print quality lives up to its ease of use. But first, let's talk about what we're printing here. This will be the front grille. Not only will it be the aesthetic base of our new console, but it will also be responsible for cooling down the system. And since I had about an hour to kill while it printed, I busied myself by modifying the fans that are going to slot into it. Two twin 5-volt 40mm Noctua fans. Aren't they cute? 
These should be both whisper quiet and move more than enough air to keep the heat from our little 10 watt system in check. However, they do have two problems. The first was just that their wires were way too long. This was easily remedied with a couple of snips. And then to bind all the wires together and keep everything inside the case looking neat and organized, I applied a little bit of heat shrink tubing. This stuff shrinks down to half of its original size when you apply some heat to it. Now normally I'd use a heat gun for this, but I forgot it in the shop, so I ended up just using the side of my soldering iron. Which, you know what, actually worked quite well. Then it was time to solve the second problem. There's just nowhere to plug these fans in on the DE10. I mean, yeah, sure, I could have plugged them into the USB ports, but that would have been both bulky and kind of ugly to look at. So instead, I opted to crimp on these generic DuPont connectors, and then we can connect the fans directly to the GPIO pins on the DE10. But we'll talk more about that later, because just then, my first print finished. Alrighty, that's our first print done. Let's see how it removes from this textured plate. Oh, that is the easiest release I've ever seen. And that's actually, a very nice little print. I really like this silk PLA that I'm using. It's got a cool look to it. All right, let me show you how this is gonna work. So basically these two little Noctua fans should just pressure fit right in there. These two little fans will intake air at the front here and then blow it out the back to cool down our FPGA. But clearly this is only a small part of the case, so let's keep printing. This second print was an experiment for me. The piece I'm making here will be a removable lid for our game console, and I designed it in such a way that the top will pop right off and provide easy access to the internals in case I ever need to get in there. But what makes this print different is that I ran it at half of its maximum speed. You see, the M5C is a seriously fast printer. It operates at speeds of 500 millimeters per second in its fast mode. But for this print, I ran it in its normal mode, which limits the speed to just 250 millimeters per second. For reference, that's still about five times faster than a lot of conventional 3D printers. But the whole reason I did this is because I wanted to see if it would have any effect on print quality. So while my experiment ran, I busied myself with a little bit of yard work, but don't worry, I was able to keep tabs on my print progress using the integrated app. Wow, would you look at this one. This is such a nice print. Oh. I think this one's even nicer than the last one. And that actually makes sense. When you're 3D printing, there's always a trade-off between speed and print quality. This one's good, mind you, like it's still a perfectly fine print, but this one is just really nice. Okay, now let's print the last piece. So this print is going to be a little bit trickier than our last two prints. These ones were very straightforward. We were just building from the bottom up and there were no overhangs, so we didn't need any supports. This next piece is a little bit more complicated with some overhangs. So the slicer has figured out where they need to go and everything, but generally this is a little bit more of a challenging print. So I'm curious to see how the M5C is gonna handle you know, a print that needs supports. This was the biggest and most complicated print so far. So I knew it would be a real test of the printer. And also I knew that it would take a while. So in order to keep myself occupied and working as efficiently as possible, I saved a few little jobs. The first one was beefing up the cooling of the DE10. Yes, we've added two fans, but those fans aren't going to be pointed directly at the chips. So I opted to add these little aluminum heat sinks as well. They'll pull heat up and away from the chips and give more surface area for the flowing air to remove heat. This will ensure that everything stays nice and cool even during long gaming sessions. Next, I had to solve the problem of power delivery. The DE10 Nano is powered by a 5 volt DC barrel plug and the integrated USB hub is powered by a 5 volt USB plug. It's kind of weird, but hey, I'm not one to judge. They also happen to be located in a really awkward spot at the top of the board. My solution is to reroute them to the back side of the case by wiring them them both to this generic barrel plug adapter that I got off of Amazon. You'll see how it all comes together soon along with the video output and the USB ports, but first I had to perform a RAM upgrade. In order to unlock more advanced emulation on this board, it's recommended that you install at least one of these 128 megabyte modules of RAM. And no, that wasn't a slip of the tongue, I actually meant to say megabytes. This is retro gaming after all. We'll check back in on the last print in a minute, but first, I've got a hankering for some woodworking. Alrighty, so here we are in the shop, and just like in my Switch Pro video, we are going to be working on some final touches. The very first thing we have to do is just cut a little bit of acrylic. 
I'm sure many of you probably noticed that my lid has a big hole in it. And that's because I wanted to leave a little bit of room for a transparent side panel. This whole case is going to be very PC inspired, but also it'll be functional because it will allow you to see the DE10's diagnostic lights once everything is all assembled. Pro tip by the way, if you're gonna cut acrylic on a CNC, make sure that you get cast acrylic because it cuts much better than extruded acrylic. Next, I wanted to dress up the front of the case with a little bit of walnut, but since this case is so small, I needed that wood to be really thin. And unfortunately, I found out the hard way that the lowest my planer will go is about 3 8 of an inch, which is not nearly enough. I was pretty sure I had a solution though, so I pressed forward and cut out what I like to call the fins. I set the depth of the cut to the exact thickness I needed, knowing that it wouldn't cut the whole way through the piece of wood. Then, once I was done, I was able to sand off the rest of the thickness using my drum sander. Lucky for me, this machine was clearly designed by a like-minded crazy person, and it let me push the sanding head right down to within one eighth of an inch of the belt. Once I sanded off enough material, the fins just popped out in this really satisfying way. I also made a set of alternate cherry fins, in case I liked the look of those better, but let's be real, I'm pretty addicted to walnut. The last step was a quick oil rub finish to seal the wood and enhance the grain a little bit. So I think that's it for all the workshop stuff at this point. We're just gonna let these guys dry. Then we're gonna head back to my office, assemble this whole machine and see if FPGAs are worth the hype. Live up to the hype. You know what I mean. And also the assembly's not gonna be the easiest thing in the world. So we still got some work to do. Like I said before, supports on overhangs can be very tough for 3D printers. Thankfully, not this one though, the default settings on the slicer made removing these supports a breeze and they came out nice and clean. Then I started screwing some standoffs in place to support the computer and I used a little trick. When I 3D modeled this case, I made those holes a quarter millimeter smaller than the threads on the standoff. That way, when I screwed them in, they cut their own corresponding counter threads. Next, it was time for power delivery. That generic barrel plug from earlier slotted perfectly into this alcove, and then in order to keep it from pushing back into the case, I laid down a little bit of glue. And I did basically the same thing for the HDMI port. This is actually an HDMI extension because just like the power ports, the video out was located in a really annoying spot, and I wanted all the IO to be routed to the back of the case. And speaking of IO, it was time to install the USB hub. I connected its five volt power plug and then screwed it down. Unfortunately, I won't be able to access all of these USB ports, but the three that are exposed on the back of the case should be plenty for my purposes. Next came the brains of the operation, the actual DE10 Nano mainboard. Fortunately, this was pretty easy. I just screwed it to the standoffs, connected the HDMI extension and the power plug, and I was all good to go. From there on out, it was all about style. Thanks to the wonders of technology, that acrylic window that I cut earlier pressure fit right into the lid and gave me a very satisfying little peel to do. I'd never been one to trust friction forever though, so I used a tiny drop of glue in each corner to secure it there. And of course, I had to integrate some magnets. So in order to attach the lid to the case, I glued four magnets into each of these corners. And in order to make sure I didn't mess up the polarity, I paired a second magnet to each of the corners, applied some glue to the corresponding pockets on the lid, and then mated the two together. Predictably, because this is me, I was completely unable to avoid the allure of using the walnut fins. It's just the best wood, so why would I use anything else? I did, however, mock up what the grill would have looked like had I used the inferior cherry wood, and you guys can debate in the comments about which one is best. Bonding the grill to the main case couldn't have been easier since the fans themselves acted like big alignment pins. And then the DuPont connectors that I attached earlier slid over a ground pin and a 5 volt pin on the GPIO header and will provide power to the fans. The top magnetically clicked into position and I was done. All right, well, there we go. That is the completed case. And well, I think it looks pretty awesome. That's really only half the story. We still have to set this thing up so that it can run some games. And more importantly, we have to answer the question of whether or not this is even worth it. So let's get into that. First of all, software. I'm gonna be leaning very heavily on the open source Mr. Project. This is a custom made operating system designed specifically for the DE10 Nano and retro game emulation. Basically, the easiest way to set this up is to download the Mr. Fusion disk image, write that to a micro SD card, and then pop that into the DE10 Nano. I've actually already done that and put that into my DE10 because, well, my case design doesn't allow for access to the micro SD card, but we'll talk more about things that I could have done better later during the postmortem analysis. Next, you plug a USB Wi-Fi card in, boot up the DE10, run an update script, 
And at this point, you can pop the SD card back out, load it up with a bunch of games that you've legally acquired, obviously, and you're basically done. It's honestly surprisingly easy and pain free. And truth be told, I almost wish it was more complicated because as soon as you boot up your console, you're greeted with this screen that lets you pick from dozens of potential hardware cores. Each one of these represents a different retro game system that the DE10 Nano can perfectly replicate inside of its FPGA core. And the ease of setup kind of betrays just how hard many members of the Mr. community had to work in order to create these cores. If you think about it, they had to figure out and map how every single chip inside of these old retro game systems worked in order to make these. In a lot of cases, that involved x-raying the chips, sanding the tops off of them, and then physically inspecting them, and going to all sorts of crazy ends to make it all happen. So yeah, just be appreciative of how insane all of this is. So, how do you control a Mr. setup? Well, that's actually a really interesting question because it is possible to use the original controllers for whatever system it is that you're emulating. With the help of what they call a snack adapter, you could plug a Super Nintendo controller right in there. But honestly, I prefer simplicity, so I'm gonna use this 8-bit Do controller connected via USB. You could also connect it wirelessly over Bluetooth, but that would introduce input latency and kind of ruin the whole point of having a Mr. slash FPGA setup. And that's it for setup. So now let's dive into some testing and see if a Mr. is better at emulation than a high end PC. My testing setup was pretty simple. I set up my camera to record 240 frames per second, pressed the button on the controller, and then I counted how many frames it took for Sonic to respond on the screen. And what I found was that on average, the Mr. had 81 milliseconds of input lag, and my PC had 99 milliseconds of input lag. Then I decided to test it against my mobile phone console, and there I was getting 129 milliseconds. So against really high-end hardware, you're looking at approximately a 20 percent decrease in input latency and then against more mid-range hardware it's probably more like 40 percent so honestly not as big of a difference as i was hoping but that's still significant and for a certain breed of purist out there reductions like that might actually be worth all this effort so now let's talk about video because a mister will generate pixel perfect reproductions of the original hardware i know some of the purists out there right now are probably screaming at me because i'm running an upscaled hdmi signal there are ways to get an analog signal out of the de10 but for simplicity and compatibility i just decided to just stick with HDMI. Thankfully, you can configure exactly how the system upscales the image and even add in fake scan lines and filters if that's your jam. But honestly, my hot take is that I think fake scan lines are kind of dumb and unless I'm playing on an actual CRT screen, I'd rather just see the blocky pixels. But I'm sure plenty of people will disagree with me in the comments. Last but not least, what are the limitations of a system like this? Because at a certain point, the size of the FPGA becomes your limiting factor. Gaming systems eventually got so complex and large, in terms of their consistor count that is, that they won't fit on this particular FPGA. And that happens right around the Nintendo 64. Unfortunately, this guy will not fit in here. I did, however, get PS1 games running, and I've heard they have a pretty close to perfectly functional core for the Sega Saturn, but that appears to be the cutoff for now. If you want to go any further than that, well then, you need a more powerful FPGA, which I have heard are in the pipeline, so maybe I'll have to revisit this project in the future and do things a little bit differently. Like, first of all, the styling. I wish this filament was a little bit darker and that the case just had some more design flares to it. I was trying really hard to make it look like a miniature PC just sitting on the desk, but I might go for something a bit more like a traditional console next time. In terms of actual construction, I think the walls would have benefited from some ridges and some gussets to make the whole thing a little bit more rigid. And I know I said that the fans themselves acted like locator pins, but I think some actual locator pins would have made the assembly a lot easier. And also, like I said earlier, being able to access the SD card would have been nice. All right, that is it for this build. So I'm gonna make all of the 3D print files for this project available to download for free down in the video description. And if you are looking for a 3D printer to print them on, well then I can highly recommend the M5C. At just $399, I think this thing is an absolute steal. You can order one off of Amazon or you can get it directly from Alker Make themselves. I'll put links for that down in the video description as well. See you guys in the next one.
Peace.